Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm glad to have this opportunity to present in this uh, conference uh, as a speaker. So uh, my talk today will be about the uh, post-COVID, uh, post-pandemic new normal and the policy implications of this uh, new normal. So basically, uh, the idea is that just as in the Great Depression of the 1930s uh, and the 2008 global financial crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020, it seems like it has also led to a new period of rethinking in economics and economic sciences. Uh, basically, uh, the idea is that the monetary and fiscal policies utilized by uh, many economies to deal with the recession, it seems like it has helped to reach disproportionately and increase the inequalities, especially considering the impacts of uh, QEs, for instance. And there's also this increasing divergence and disproportionate responses to the, to the policies implemented. And there is a, this new uh, focus on climate change and the green revolution in this new era. So we'll uh, focus on uh, these aspects mainly. Uh, it's basically a new period of questioning neoliberal policies, the search for alternative ways of running economies and getting out of the crisis as uh, pointed out by Roderick. Um, and a new period of uh, reorganizing economies, the financial system and the societies basically about uh, reorganization of relationship between uh, different factors of production. So that's our uh, new normal. Uh, and the argument basically is that uh, instead of the um, uh, a retro modern neoclassical perspective that focuses on growth and productivity, especially low cost growth, it is, it seems like uh, now uh, time to consider uh, new economic programs and national strategies with uh, strong social aspects and innovations, public interventions, social and human development, uh, more focus on universal basic income policies, environmental impact of different policies implemented and uh, a lot of new uh, waves of alternative globalization around the world as in the Chinese example that uh, we may be able to talk about uh, if we have time. So uh, this new normal, basically comparing it uh, with the past trends, uh, consider the classical uh, retro approach that focuses on efficiency and productivity and uh, assuming the markets would act as an invisible hand, uh, just as in the example of monetary focus uh, that pays attention to low inflation, high productivity in the long run. And the, um, Post Second World War Keynesian approach of public interventions to correct the market inefficiencies uh, with uh, more focus on stabilizing economic activity and uh, decreasing volatility uh, in general. So, the new normal and new perspectives, it uh, requires a more focus on uh, issues such as wealth, income inequality, social, human development, inclusive development. Um, and uh, new issues such as climate change, the green revolution that is uh, increasing uh, popularity and uh, the search for alternative ways uh, of getting out of the new type of new sort of crisis. Um, basically, um, we're talking about the effects and damages and contributions of the uh, latest epidemic to the world economy and national economies. And um, uh, especially uh, shifts in policy making and uh, uh, the similar impacts as in the more focus on, focus on a green revolution and uh, climate change. And we're mainly uh, focusing on changes in the mindset of uh, national economic policies. Uh, that will be more effective in uh, dealing with the crisis uh, that are brought uh, up by uh, that type of epidemics that we faced in uh, 2020, uh, for example. In that sense, it uh, seems like the 
2020 uh, was a uh, good wake up call, the latest uh, COVID uh, case. And we basically observed that when labor markets were closed during the pandemic, uh, capital also became dysfunctional and even completed uh, that uh, period with serious losses. And it has also taught us that the current global order, which uh, pays more to the capital, most basically, it cannot be maintained uh, as it is today. And that the uh, capitalist focus, it can only be sustained by uh, labor of the remaining 99%. And therefore, uh, their quality of life, their concerns should also be taken into account in uh, policy making. And it has also, uh, taught us the importance of public interventions and creation of uh, public goods that uh, would work for everyone, basically. <coughs> this pandemic era, it was basically a period where governments were stepping in and acting as buyers of last resort, just as in uh, the popular um, idea of central banks acting as the lenders of last resort. Uh, in times of depression. Uh, this time in 2020, we just uh, saw that uh, governments, uh, they were in the field and very proactive and uh, using all sorts of interventions to protect the markets. And uh, we also observed uh, the need for more regulation and also further uh, steps uh, uh, leading to the green revolution. And there is actually a very extensive <coughs> research uh, discussing this different aspects of this uh, pandemic uh, shock, uh, such as uh, the supply and demand shocks due to the closures that the economy faced and the lack of lockdown downs and uh, postponed investment. Um, in some economies, such as US, uh, there's also a few papers showing that, uh, just as in the Bloom example, uh, that um, more and more um, production is basically done by working from home. So this type of new trends, they will be uh, extremely important looking forward. And there's also, um, policy response divergence across world economies. That is also uh, pretty much uh, something new uh, for this new era of post pandemic. And uh, some paper discussing uh, especially efficiency of uh, the potential fiscal policy instruments that could be used and uh, the need for increasing role for governments. And a lot of data also showing uh, the uh, fiscal expansion and rate cuts that were much more dominant uh, during that uh, COVID-19 epidemic of 2020. And uh, also new publications showing uh, uh, new waves of uh, climate change and the green revolution. And a few papers also pointing out that uh, governments and policymakers, they were ready to do whatever it takes to ensure stabilization. Um, so as pointed out by this extensive research, basically uh, it was, uh, uh, it was, and looking forward, seems like this new era will, will be, and uh, a new period of uh, more and more intervention and regulation. And, just as an example, if you look at different countries and the policy responses, it seems like comparing <coughs> pre-COVID and post-pandemic eras, uh, we have clear evidence of um, huge monetary expansion and weight cuts, uh, both in emerging economies and uh, the advanced economies. So monetary policy, and uh, fiscal policy they were used very effectively uh, during uh, this crisis.
And fiscal deficit uh, data also shows that um, fiscal policy was also used uh, very effectively. And that led to huge fiscal deficits all around the world, uh, not just in uh, developing economies, but all countries, including Asia and Middle East, uh, Eastern economies, they face huge fiscal deficits. And <coughs> data shows that uh, there was over 8 trillion monetary expansion or credit expansion all around the world, but deficit and balance sheets were up by 20% uh, and 10% uh, respectively on average. And there was an even bigger, about 12 trillion dollar fiscal expansion and subsidies uh, all across the world economies. And here we have a picture of uh, the monetary announcements uh, with the darker um, uh, color representing more uh, and bigger interventions, monetary expansion, as in the case of the US and Europe, for example. And we also have this paper from Elgin uh, that, uh, and his quotes that shows uh, a cumulative uh, COVID-19 economic stimulus index for world economies and showing that countries such as the US and especially Japan um, having uh, bigger stimulus packages compared to at least the others. And the data for different world economies also shows that uh, balance sheet of central banks they were increased at uh, uh, unprecedented uh, rates uh, compared to the earlier periods. Uh, especially the Japanese case is very interesting. Uh, they have been in recession since mid 1990s and uh, uh, they still uh, used monetary expansion, uh, expansion at uh, an extremely high rates. Uh, in Turkey, on the other hand, uh, according to the official figures, there were about um, 180 billion uh, Turkish lira, should be Turkish lira, uh, outright stimulus to the citizens and uh, over 300 billion Turkish lira to the businesses. And other measures such as uh, various tax breaks, short term work subsidies, and other type of fiscal expansion uh, to deal with the recession. So basically, this recession it shows that uh, it showed that uh, policymakers uh, they're not out of uh, ammunition. Um, they still have the options to use uh, to deal with the recessions, uh, the uh, epidemics, and markets. They were insured, and it contributed a lot to the macro stability. Uh, income flow it was enabled and factory business closures that were prevented and uh, more and more regulations are coming along towards a green revolution. And different type of policies, uh, some of them very innovative, they were used. Uh, the QEs that uh, we basically uh, came more familiar uh, post-2008 uh, and the negative interest rates, as in the central bank uh, uh, um, European, uh, some European economies, and including the European Central Bank, they already have negative interest rates. And some countries, such as um, Germany, they also have uh, negative interest rates over the months. Um, fiscal expansions, uh, helicopter money, uh, paying directly to the public, and a lot of uh, swap agreements between central banks, uh, short-term world subsidies. We talked about that uh, in the Turkish example. They were used very, uh, very often and very effectively, actually. And so uh, we are uh, pretty much familiar with what happened. Uh, uh, really huge weak demand, supply chain dis disruptions, 
recently um, the shock, shocks, or I should say, uh, led to energy crisis. Uh, and we're still uh, facing that energy crisis and uh, increasing inflation all, of those, all across the world economies. And world economies, they faced uh, growth divergences. And um, in many countries, close to zero inflation and interest rates, although recently they have been increasing. And especially the increasing debt burden, that is potentially a much bigger uh, issue, much bigger problem. Um, the crisis, uh, the pandemic also showed that uh, uh, income distribution was affected much more in the sense that uh, most of the low income jobs, they require usually physical presence, while a lot of high income jobs, um, they have the option to work from home. Uh, <coughs> in a lot of financial market IT sector jobs, for example, and according to uh, data, uh, as in this, uh, Oxfam example, the power to, power to risk uh, is very, very high. About uh, 500 million people are at risk of being in poverty uh, looking forward. And the COVID-19 epidemic, it decreased global output by 10 to 20%, according to some data. And um, public institutions and governments uh, their interventions, policies, they were at the core of the pandemic because of this huge negative effect all across the world. And in the post-COVID uh, era, uh, considering all these huge negative impacts, it seems like uh, there will be a lot of uh, discussion about how to make uh, growth and development in this new year more inclusive and how to deal with the already high public debts uh, that especially went up uh, with the stimulus packages uh, during the pandemic and potential tail risks of currency crisis um, and in some cases uh, the issues of um, facing more totalitarian and oppressive regimes. And in a lot of economies, the uh, risk of increasing uncertainty, even high inflation risk. And as in the um, BRI example, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, new alternative globalization uh, strategies, um, and most recently, uh, with the post-COVID uh, high growth and high demand, uh, the new trends of energy prices, uh, global chip prices, shortages, there are new issues. Uh, in the Turkish example, for example, um, in this new era of post-pandemic, uh, the policymakers they started talking about a new economic model uh, that includes lower interest rate, low current account deficit, even surpluses, financial stability, uh, production and development, and more focus on exports. Uh, in a way, uh, focusing uh, more on decreasing uh, dependency and dependency on um, uh, foreign investment, especially portfolio investments. So. Uh, we'll see how this new economic model uh, works, but it is a reality of post-pandemic in Turkey. Um, the COVID-19 epidemic, it has actually uh, uh, taught us a lot, um, as in the more proactive policy interventions and uh, more effective usage of uh, QEs, fiscal policy, monetary policy coordination, and uh, policymakers being ready to do whatever it takes to ensure stabilization. And uh, new means of uh, stimulus packages, uh, expansions, uh, such as the uh, 
direct stimuluses, helicopter drop money uh, to the citizens, cash bonuses, tax holidays. Um, they were all new lessons uh, of the post pandemic. And um, more interventions focus increasing role for government and public uh, institutions. Um, even uh, talking about a new QEs uh, with global perspective, uh, European Monetary Union, World Bank, IMF, QEs uh, for the whole world economy. Uh, these are uh, potential options uh, that could be uh, considered in the future uh, as uh, they were actually uh, discussed a lot during the uh, pandemic. And more focus on lower current account deficit and dependence in many countries, uh, just as in the Turkish example. And this new normal, uh, the post-COVID uh, new normal is also a period of more digitalization uh, in the e-commerce industry, in the digital payment systems, uh, the digital sovereign currencies, uh, they are uh, actually becoming more and more popular uh, in the Chinese case, in the European case, and more focus on um, <coughs> increasing income inequalities uh, all across the world and means to decrease it, uh, means new ways to decrease structural unemployment and uh, using blockchain technologies in all industries, not just uh, the digital cryptocurrencies, but in all other industries um, to increase efficiency. Um, and online and remote jobs, distance learning, uh, these are all new trends that could potentially lead to um, less uh, inequality and uh, much lower unemployment rates looking forward. And um, NFTs, um, fungible tokens, uh, the paid social media posts, uh, decentralized social media finance, uh, they're all new trends of this uh, post-pandemic new normal. So basically uh, we have seen the policies that were used before and during the uh, uh, COVID-19 epidemic and how it has disproportionately uh, affected uh, citizens, uh, individuals or around the world and increasing divergences um, across the world economies in terms of policies in, uh, implemented and the new trends such as green revolution and more focus on climate change and more criticism of the post 1980s liberalist policies and search for alternative ways of running economies. And the need for reorganization of economies, the financial system and society, uh, reorganizing relationship between production factors, they are all realities of this new normal. And therefore uh, our argument is that uh, instead of the popular um, neoclassical perspective of post-1980s that focuses on growth and uh, productivity, especially low cost uh, growth. Um, it seems like this new normal is, uh, it seems like it will be a period of uh, new economic programs, national strategies with more social aspects innovations, public interventions, and more focus on social human development and new policies to decrease inequalities and uh, new alternative globalization strategies as in the BRI example that we mentioned. Uh, so the policy implications of the uh, post COVID-19 pandemic seems like uh, they are really huge and the policy implications are also uh, extremely uh, huge. So uh, 
Thank you for listening to me and I will be uh, ready for any questions uh, you may have. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you for listening.